welcome to the 30th episode of Byzantium and Friends. I am Anthony, your host. So a while back, I asked you all to send me questions that you had uh, about Byzantium or really anything. And boy, did I, did I get questions. Uh, thank you all. I've, there was a flood of them. I'm still trying to organize them into thematic clusters uh, so that we might have some coherent um, episode discussions about questions that relate to the same topic. There might also be some uh, catch-all sort of variety hour um, episodes with some of those questions, but I've been trying to pick out the ones that cluster around a specific theme, and I'll be releasing those episodes interspersed with all the uh, usual programming. And the one I thought I would do first was a set of questions that a number of you sent in about the place of Byzantium in modern Greece. This is a very reasonable question. Greece is the modern country that has the most affinities with Byzantium in terms of language and religion and partially geography and history. And yet, there's very little scholarship about this. So let me let me be clear about what you might find in print and, and what, what you won't. And I, I tried in this episode to cover the latter. So what you're going to find in scholarly discussions of, of Byzantium and modern Greece is mostly sort of very abstract and theoretical discussions of how Byzantium was understood by 19th century national Greek historians, uh, people like Zabelios and Paparigopoulos, and how they tried to integrate Byzantium into a grand narrative of Greek continuity from antiquity to the present. And these are relatively uh, textual, historiographical studies. Now, this kind of scholarship has mostly to do with the articulation of a modern national narrative in the 19th century. And you'll also find some scholarship on modern Greek literature that has to do with Byzantine themes. Um, there's some, some of that. But other than that, there's very, very little. A handful of articles on how Byzantium is represented in school textbooks, occasionally some dissertations on that, but that's about it. What's really missing is some kind of synthetic study about the place of Byzantium in modern Greek life. And by modern Greek life, I mean right now, like what's going on now, or at least in the past generation, so that we're not always going back to the 19th century in those textbooks. So I thought the ideal person to have this conversation with would be Dimitris Kralis, um, my friend uh, and professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver and director of the Hellenic Studies program there. And he and I, he, we go back a while, as you'll hear in this episode, and you know, we both grew up in Greece and haven't lived there in quite some time. We, we, we visit, but um, you know, we don't live there. We don't um, enjoy the perks and endure the disadvantages of actually living in Greece. But we do have some perspective on it, and we, we work in academic programs that involve both Byzantium and modern Greece. And so I, I thought it would be interesting to speak with him about it, and indeed it turned out to be one of the funnest uh, conversations that I've had for the podcast, and as, as you will see. In drawing up the questions in advance that we wanted to touch on, we tried to cover a broad range of areas of modern Greek life where one might encounter Byzantium or where it actually plays a role. Um, and the, these range from symbols and streets to statues and politics and religious politics, politics of the church, the neo-Orthodox movement, occasionally literature, and just our own experiences. Uh, but it, it, it ended up being rather coherent. So I hope you'll enjoy the conversation as we move through um, all of those different domains. And I thought it would be fun to have this as our 30th episode. Uh, if you might, you might recall that Dimitris was the 10th guest that I had. Uh, so he seems to be my go-to guy for landmark episode numbers. I also want to draw your attention to the medievalist.net website, uh, which has also begun to host this podcast. So thanks to them there. And you may want to check out the medieval podcast that is also hosted on that site. Um, I'm actually thinking of some more episodes along the lines of Byzantium and the medieval West. Um, so stay tuned for those. 
in the meantime, here is my discussion with uh, Dimitris on Byzantium and modern Greek life. Hello, Dimitri. Welcome back to the podcast. Well, it's good to be back. So this isn't exactly a, an interview. We're not talking here about um, anything that either of us have, have published on. And I, I have to say, this topic, the presence of Byzantium in modern Greek life, was requested by many of the listeners in the questions that they sent me. And it's not a topic that many people have written about. I have to say, it's, uh, it's difficult to find scholarship on this question. And I'm talking very specifically about the, the felt presence of Byzantium in a sort of explicit overt way in modern Greek life, as opposed to sort of stratospheric historiographical questions about 19th century national right, histories and so forth. So I'm not talking about people like Labellius and all these foundational Greek historians, but just talking about like now, really, um, how Greeks experience Byzantium. Uh, so I thought we'd talk about that. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Well, but so just to give uh, our listeners a sense of background. So you and I went to the same high school. And were you in a, you were a year younger? I was a year behind, yes. Uh, yes. Um, and so this is a sort of preppy Greek private school where like all of our prime ministers come from. In fact, I think the current prime minister was a classmate of ours only a few years older. Yes, that's exactly the case. Yes. Do you still use the secret handshake? Uh, only, only when I can hide it uh, in the best possible way. I, I don't want to be caught out. <laughs> uh, anyway, this school is called Athens College. It's a high school. It's not a college. Um, and it's, it's in Greek, but it, it has some American um, associations. And, you know, fun fact, the Loeb Classical Library Translator of Procopius, uh, Dewing, H.B. Dewing, he was the president of Athens College for a period in the 20s, I believe. So early on when it was founded, basically. Yeah, yeah, toward the beginning. Yeah. He was an American classicist. He was brought in to be head of school. And I think that's when he was working on the translation of the secret history for the Loeb series. Yes. So I was, <laughs> it's sort of ironic that I would have revised his entire translation of Procopius. It was a good translation. Um, anyway, uh, I found that out while I was trying to find some information on him. There's not that much. Okay, so so we went to the school and so we... Um, it was a, it's a, classes were in Greek. It had these kind of American associations, but otherwise our curriculum was pretty standard for Greece. Um, and I, at the time, of course, I had no inclination that I would be a Byzantinist. I was a physicist. And you, I think, specialized in? I basically uh, was uh, preparing for exams to go to uh, economics, but I cheated my dad who expected me to become a banker and applied for political science. I never told him and ended up in political science. And from there, somehow ended up in Byzantium. And, and we're now both bureaucrats. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> uh, very Byzantine in a way. Yes. Uh, less efficient, probably, than the Byzantine bureaucracy. All right. So let's talk, about, let's talk about Byzantium and where you might see it in modern Greek life. Beca and for, for the moment, let's bracket off the church, because that's a special topic. We'll get into that later on. But I was thinking this morning, so if you go to Spain, you go to Madrid, and outside the royal palace in Madrid, there's a little park. And in that park is a row of statues of the former kings. And the ones that I remember are the Visigothic kings, <laughs> right? These are the, so these are the Visigothic kings of Spain from the fifth century to the early eighth. And th they're generally made fun of in Spain today. You know, those, the Visigothic kings, their jokes and their names are kind of funny, like Wamba and Sisebuto and all of this. But they are understood as our kings. Now, they might have been a while ago, but they are our kings. I do not have the sense in Greece 
that anybody thinks of the Byzantine emperors as our kings? It's, it, it's tricky. Uh, it's tricky, isn't it? Because there is no such uh, uh, statue expressed uh, uh, genealogy. There's the random dropped statue of an emperor uh, who might appear in a public space because he served some mayor's or bishop's agenda. I'm thinking of the Constantine XI uh, just outside the cathedral in Athens, uh, which is a hideous statue, by the way. Uh, but, um, but there is no clear sense of how to integrate that uh, to a broader storyline of uh, Greek king kingship, which of course in Greece is a bit tricky because we got rid of the kingship in the 70s. So there's other political issues that enter into this discussion. But yes, there, you, you do not see that in the same way. Yeah, there's no, you know, park of the the statues of the kings that includes Byzantium. And let's get to Constantine the Eleventh uh, Paleologus in a moment because I think he's a very he's a unique case and is in, and is included for um, special reasons. But the um, the he, here's an interesting fact: when when the Greek Revolution broke out, 1821 against the Ottoman Empire. Some of the earliest, in one of the early assemblies that uh, the revolutionaries had, I think it was the one at Epidaurus, reference was made in the official documents to our Christian, well, kings or emperors, it can be translated either way, which was a reference to the Byzantine emperors. In other words, the idea was that the laws of the state that was being founded would be based on the laws of our Christian kings, meaning the kings of Byzantium. So at that time, at least someone had this idea of monarchical continuity. And, you know, it came up, you know, with King Constantine in Greece uh, in the in turn of the 20th century, um, in the Balkan Wars. So he, he was Constantine the first of Greece, but there's some people called him Constantine the 12th to imply some sort of continuity with the Byzantine past. But that sense I think was lost. Uh, so I don't think that there's any kind of sense of political continuity between Byzantium and modern Greece, right? W yes. Would you agree? I think I think it's m much more nebulous, and it comes up in both conscious and, and unconscious ways. To to connect with something that is uh, really current, the whole discussion about Hagia Sophia becoming a, a mosque, for example, uh, and this is not a discussion about the church; it's more about the monument as a, as a Byzantine monument. Um, even as this is happening. Uh, one of Greece's top four soccer clubs, AEK, Athletic Union of Constantinople, is building a stadium that they're naming Hagia Sophia. Uh, oh, really? Where, yes. Uh, uh, where even if you see how the arches are built on the outside of the building, there is a certain attempt to capture the arches that you see in the drums and uh, in the architecture of Hagia Sophia in, in Constantinople. So that idea... Is, is certainly uh, there. Of course, the irony in that, and I don't know whether anyone has picked it up, is that the four posts on which the lighting will be uh, placed bracket the stadium pretty much like the minarets bracket Hagia Sophia. I don't know whether anyone picked that up, but anyhow. Right. Um, and, and on, on the unconscious level, I grew up in a, in a household that was pretty split politically, a bourgeois dad uh, and a left-wing uh, 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 mom. Uh, and my mother, of course, like any person in the left in Greece, would listen to Thodorakis, the Greece's kind of premier uh, composer of the left and an important musician uh, in general. And uh, in Thodorakis' work, uh, uh, one, of his, uh, one of his works is uh, Romniosini. Uh, and, uh, you know, my mother would have celebrated this record, would have sung songs from it, and uh, uh, she would never have thought that Romniosini actually means Romanitas, and uh, in some ways alludes to, to Byzantium, but, but it's there somewhere in the ether, this, uh, this, this concept. Yeah, so just for the listener's benefit, uh, Dimitri here is alluding to a concept, uh, Romiosini, which is a, a modern Greek version of Romanness, which alludes specifically to Byzantium in a Greek context. And so the idea is that modern Greeks are heirs to a double kind of identity. So the one is the Hellenic identity, which associates with antiquity and classical temples and ancient Greek. And the other is the Roman identity, which uh, correlates mostly with 
um, uh, orthodoxy and more sort of vernacular folk practices at home, not the sorts of things that you put in tourist posters, presumably, right? So there's a kind of Greek identity that's international and you project to the outside and it's much more classical and there's a more sort of vernacular folk orthodox identity that you do at home and not you're not sort of performing it for for tourists or something although by now we do but anyway that's so th there are actually some pretty good anthropological studies of this michael hertzfeld has written about it um in a in a book uh, ours once more i think and so forth so um yeah we'll 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 get to those kinds of uh of distinctions that you mentioned constantine the 11th palaeologus his statue um and there's one in outside the metropolis of uh, in Athens, and there's one also at in uh, Sparta, uh, which is uh, near his own capital of Mistras in the Peloponnese. And yeah, I, I could be wrong, but his are the only statues of Byzantine emperors that I know in Greece. Maybe yeah. there are others. I don't know of others, but of course I have not done exhaustive, an exhaustive survey. I, I see Byzantine emperors far more present in street signs uh, in uh, in Greece, and and they do have a place uh, on on Greek streets for sure. Yeah, especially there's that cluster in the center of Athens around uh, like Kolonaki or or um, the, around the Likavitos, right, where it's like Basil II and all his generals. Mm -hmm. And they all they're <laughs> like they're they're like literally arranged in formation around the emperor. Yeah, um, and, uh, and and of course then you find them in you find I think Jimmy Ski in Thessaloniki, uh, so uh, uh, an emperor with a history of campaigning in the Balkans uh, yes. against Slavic peoples appears uh, at a central spot in Thessaloniki, ironically very close to Aristotelus. Uh, square. So, I mean, the two paths yes. coming together in an interesting way. Yes, the street names are, are definitely an indication of this. I, I have the sense that more street names in Greece are classical and or refer to events in modern Greek history than to Byzantium. Uh, but the, certainly a lot of the more famous Byzantine uh, figures sometimes get, get a street. Uh, I, but I want to come back to Constantine the 11th because I'm curious as to why he gets statues, right? And, and other emperors don't. And I think it's largely for well, three reasons. First, because he was the only emperor who for a long time ruled in the Peloponnese, like in the geographical space of Greece. He was the despot at Morea. Um, and secondly, because the, so the narrative of modern Greek history requires the Greek people to be subject to the Ottoman uh, Ottoman Empire, and and that's very much a part of the national historiography. And in order to you need you need a kind of um, symbolic gateway into that period. And since he was the last Byzantine emperor, he died defending the capital. So he's that symbolic moment after which the period of Ottoman rule begins. Mm -hmm. And being the last one, and this is the third reason, all these legends, you know, of like Arthurian return, you know, that he, he walked back into the column and, you know, will emerge when, you know, whatever. Um, and so I think that for those reasons, he just retained a livelier uh, place in, in the consciousness. And in simple syntactical terms, I mean, he's the opening of a bracket that can only close with another kind of Byzantine Greek emperor. So in a historical teleology that uh, might want to see a return to that, uh, there is a very logical connection there. Last Byzantine emperor, and maybe there will be something coming after that once you close the bracket of uh, national failure, if you wish, and uh, subordination. Yeah, it's the revolution, right? Yeah. Yeah, so he, he opens a period that ends with the revolution, the revolution begins another period. I, I, I think there, those two, the, a figure and an event, are used to sort of define history that way. Um, and we'll get back to the way in which Greeks divide history into periods. Um, but I also wanted to pick up on your comment about the, the soccer team, Ayak, because its flag, 
right? It's, I don't know, Herald or something is um, this faux Byzantine eagle with two headed eagle, right? With it's holding what, a sword or something. And, mm -hmm. and it's the same as the flag of the Greek Orthodox church. Yep. So they're very exactly. easy to confuse. And both Hayek and Pauk in Northern Greece, which is the uh, Northern Greek equivalent, the Thessalonica equivalent of a team with refugee origins from, uh, from uh, Istanbul, uh, have the same double-headed eagle oh. uh, in, uh, as part of their symbols, yes. Uh, I'm quite lost when it comes to Greek soccer teams and, or any soccer teams, or any teams at all about any sport. Right. <laughs> um, Apart from the blues and the greens, I, I assume. Those, yeah, those I can recognize. Um, so, right, so these are the probably the most visible Byzantine emblems um, in the streets of Gre Greece, right? It's just the mm -hmm. flag of Ayak, or which is also the flag of the Greek Orthodox Church. Um, and I, I actually found a store that was selling one and I got one just to have it here and, you know, to use with students and so on. But when I show it to Greeks here, half of them think it's a a, I'm making some sort of declaration of orthodoxy or that that's my sports team. Yeah. It's loaded. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's got the, the yellow field and it's a black Eagle and it's holding a sword and all of that. Um, anyway. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, since we've alluded to it already. So let's talk about the church because I think that the church is definitely the, the most, um, easily and closely associated institution with Byzantium, right, in, in Greece? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Uh, I, I think in multiple levels, um, and I don't know that uh, there is a logic in the, in the order of things that I might enumerate, but um, think of language. Uh, we have uh, gone through a process of uh, adoption of a demotic Greek uh, uh, language, uh, a process formalized in the late 70s, uh, where we uh, even abolished uh, accents and uh, breathings. Uh, uh, but uh, when you look at the ways in which clerics uh, uh, speak, especially in formal settings, and especially the ways in which they produce text uh, in formal announcements, they always come in a archaizing language that seeks to connect itself with the Byzantine tradition. Now, it's not exactly Nikitas Honiatis' writing, uh, but uh, it, it's easy for anyone to follow, but it nevertheless uh, alludes to that past. So I, th I think this is one thing that becomes very evident to anyone listening to it. I don't know how consciously uh, the audience uh, interprets that as a Byzantine thing, but perhaps they do. Uh, certainly, the church, however, uses it for this for for for, for this reason. Um, yeah, you're very right. So, language is such a such an interesting area of research on this question because, um, so you know, modern Greek is a it's a modern demotic vernacular language, but because of the long history um, of the Greek language in general, it has um, expressions, grammatical forms, idioms and registers that can be used to allude to different pasts or different, you know, cultural phases. So there are ways of alluding to classical antiquity. You know, you can use a, a classical phrase or maybe an optative <laughs> or something like that. But you're, you're totally right. So there are ways of speaking Greek that make it very ecclesiastical. And they come out of this. Um, so in Byzantium, you could write super, you know, super formal Attic Greek, like you mentioned, Honiatis, uh, that's very, very difficult to read and probably impossible to follow if someone reads it aloud. But the most common form of writing was probably ecclesiastical um, Greek, which is, uh, you know, formal, but not, 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 not on that level. Uh, it's probably closer to the New Testament, well, maybe a little bit more formal than the New Testament. And, and you're right. Uh, so in ecclesiastical circles, um, especially the clergy are trained to speak in a way that evokes that, that whole world. Yeah. There's, 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 there's other ways of, uh, of, uh, of looking at this. Um, um, there's a sense of uh, timelessness that at times uh, 
comes out of the pronouncements of uh, archbishops of Athens, for example. Uh, I have it in my, in my mind, and I don't remember the exact year, but it was towards the last years of uh, Archbishop Seraphim uh, in the 90s, before the Christodoulos uh, uh, days, uh, when um, he, uh, he came to the Maximu uh, mansion, which is the prime minister's uh, uh, sort of uh, quotation marks home uh, and base, uh, for a swearing in, or maybe not Maximo, maybe the presidential um, uh, palace, uh, for the swearing in of a, of a government. And uh, there was a bit of banter between him and uh, I don't remember which politician about the swearing in. And he said, well, you know, I've seen all of you before and uh, many of you who are not here and I'm sure I'll see others. Uh, and it really felt as if you have a, Byzantine um, patriarch like Stuzitis in the 11th century who has seen them all, the emperors, and uh, he's going to be there, he's going to be timeless, the church is always going to be there, all of you people will change. So even that notion, uh, and as it is projected for the cameras and for the audiences, is quite interesting to me. Right, because bishops hold their appointment for life, whereas politicians come and go. And th this is a pattern that you see in Byzantium pretty often. I mean, the emperors obviously can stay for longer, but uh, your run of the mill politicians, you know, they come and go. Uh, yeah, uh, there's also, um, well, I mean, have you, do you want to say anything about uh, Byzantine, uh, sorry, uh, church leaders in modern Greece who, you know, use the Byzantine past for political reasons or for their policies? Well, uh, I, my sense, uh, and it's more like a feeling because I, I could not cite specific uh, instances to you, is that uh, Christodoulos in the 90s and early 2000s uh, uh, used Byzantium as, uh, as a past uh, you, you could mine. Um, and, uh, and it is interesting because uh, this is something that happens in a historically uh, sort of uh, interesting uh, time when uh, there is a certain uh, uh, shedding of the guilt of uh, uh, engaging with the church after uh, 1989, uh, the fall of the wall, a certain discrediting of uh, left-wing ideas which had been uh, buttressing a certain secular approach of the, uh, of the polity in Greece. And here comes Christodoulos with this very hieratic presence, but at the same time, very populist. I see him as a, a, our modern Greek Kirularios, if you wish, talking to the children and calling the children to come back uh, to the church, invoking also uh, a, a longer uh, past, uh, going all the way back to, to, to Byzantium. And, and this is also a person who um, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, in, is engaging more globally. If I'm not mistaken, he was the one who dealt with uh, uh, John Paul when the questions of John Paul's visit came up and uh, whether there should be an apology for 1204. Uh, so suddenly we're weaving modern Greek history with the Fourth Crusade and we're having much bigger discussions. Yeah, this actually came up in a question sent by one of the listeners. Um, so, you know, what was so controversial about the Pope's uh, visit to Greece? This was uh, uh, John Paul II in, I think, 99, I think it was. Uh, there, there were people rioting uh, about that. Um, <laughs> why does that happen? Well, because we are at that particular moment uh, in an instance where uh, uh, the church itself and perhaps uh, circles probably more associated with uh, the right, but I don't want to call this exclusive and maybe we want to discuss this right and left thing in Greece and the church because it is not really that straightforward, uh, that some circles see an opportunity to, to activate this, uh, this past, uh, to, to speak of grievances. Uh, to, uh, to evoke the specter of uh, Western uh, hostility. Also keep in mind, we are at a very interesting moment politically in the 90s. Uh, this is uh, Greece under the socialists uh, of Kostasimitis, who's uh, seen as a modernizing uh, 
a pro-European individual who's also pushing forward uh, policies about the removal of religion from uh, uh, the identity cards uh, as a part of the secularization of the state. And suddenly the Pope probably lands in a much bigger constellation of questions uh, uh, and political issues that uh, are arising in Greece and gets weaponized. His visit gets weaponized because more is happening here. This is not just about the Pope. This is about the church taking a claim in uh, Greek public space uh, and fighting also internal wars in Greece. Uh, so that's my interpretation, that it is far broader than just uh, connecting with the Byzantine past. The Byzantine past allows you to do things with it. Uh, sure. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. So this was a period of fairly rapid secularization in, in Greek society, and especially in the instruments uh, of the state, like the ID cards. And there was a kind of orthodox backlash in, in part to that. I, I remember massive demonstrations against removing um, religious affiliation from the ID cards. A million people in Athens. It, yeah, yeah. Um, and and it in, in you know in in Greek, ID card and identity are the same word, right? Taftotita. And so it literally was a matter of identity. Right. Yeah. It, it, it was very easy to make that transition. And the, the, the Pope's presence activated uh, many of these um, sort of very latent uh, or sometimes overt uh, feelings of Orthodox identity. But but here I, I have to I have to insist that I think e either hostility to Catholicism or um, skepticism of Catholicism is very deeply ingrained in the Orthodox tradition and not just in Greece. And I would even go so far as to say that Orthodox identity as such wasn't, didn't really fully emerge until the Fourth Crusade and its aftermath. That is when most Orthodox people, like people on the ground, right? I'm not talking about bishops and so forth realized that there was a big gap between them and Catholic Western Europe, uh, whom they, um, ex which they experienced mostly in the form of uh, merchants whom they thought were mostly either ripping them off or, you know, controlling too much of their trade and crusaders, uh, which, which uh, led to some unpleasantness. <laughs> but, um, anyway, but I think that this, sus this suspicion of the West um, that you see in a lot of Orthodox countries is linked to that and, and way, goes way, way, way back. I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, so, <laughs> apart, so apart from being in the same high school, Dimitri and I um, overlapped briefly in military service uh, on, on Lesbos. And I remember... In the, the, do you remember the, the division priest? And his first name was, believe it or not, was Komnignos. Oh, how appropriate! Do you remember this guy? Okay, it was he was a perfectly nice guy, um, not pushy at all, and you know whatever you could have interesting conversations with him. But he had these little cards, like playing cards, and he would leave them on our bunk beds every day. Uh, when he got around to it. And each of those cards had on it an error of the Catholics. Okay. So it's like the Saddam Hussein cards only for Catholic heresy. <laughs> yes. And it, this was, this is like a Byzantine tradition that starting in the well, 11th, 12th century, uh, mostly after the 13th, the Byzantines would compile lists of Latin errors everything from theological errors to you know they eat bears or whatever and um and he would leave these little you know here's a your heresy of the day <laughs> so yeah. i think this anti-catholicism linked to sort of fervent orthodox identity i think it goes pretty deep it's it certainly does uh, at, but 1999 uh, we have to add uh, an, an extra component beyond secularization and beyond uh, um, concern with, uh, with the West and Catholicism. This is a time when uh, 
uh, after the earthquakes in both Greece and Turkey. Uh, there is a rapprochement with our traditional sort of uh, enemy. Uh, so what do you do as Greek church uh, when you have been mobilizing certain nationalist uh, sort of reflexes uh, to, to keep relevant? Suddenly focusing on the West specifically uh, also is convenient because now uh, the narrative is we actually love our Turkish neighbors, we helped them with the earthquake, they helped us with the earthquake, and now we're all watching Turkish series on TV. Uh, so there, there is a lot happening there. It's a, it's a really interesting instance. Can I go back to the, to the army, uh, though? Because sure, uh, sure. I think this is a, this is a space that, um, that gets to be rather interesting. Uh, uh, anyone who, who has the military experience is exposed to, to a lot of uh, the church. Um, there is more church present in the army than on your everyday life. Uh, uh, there is uh, icons in every single uh, barracks room. Uh, there's icons in, uh, in offices. Uh, they all, they're all produced en masse by, the, obviously there's uh, purveyors of, uh, of holy equipment for the army. Uh, and there's a clearly procurement and budget lines uh, that, that deal with these things. Um, but uh, there is also... Uh, license on the part of the officer corps uh, when necessary to, to, to mobilize this. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a personal experience. Um, I assumed that I would go to the army and, uh, and keep my identity as a kind of a atheist agnostic kind of secular uh, individual. And every day in the morning, you, you have to uh, present yourself with your weapon in line and uh, in parade ground and, uh, and pray. Uh, and, uh, and here I am not crossing myself. Now you will ask, how do you cross yourself holding a rifle? But that's another story. Um, and, uh, and on one day, uh, this, uh, officer, a captain turns to me, Kralis, why are you not crossing yourself? And the stuttering kind of, back then I had an MA in Byzantine studies. I was one of the most educated people, if not the most educated person on, 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 in camp. Uh, the stuttering Kralis goes, well, you know, it's a, a matter of personal, you know, belief of conscience. He goes, what conscience? Don't you know anything about our history and blah, blah, blah? And I said, I'm a historian. At which point he just exploded and said, I don't even remember what he said. Uh, I mean, I, I kind of collapsed in tears, uh, to tell you the truth. And then everybody was shocked. Why is this hyper-educated person being funny about all this? Uh, and uh, one person who clearly understood that I'm okay, but what's, what's wrong? He says, Carlis, what's going on? I said, well, it's a matter of consciousness. He's just attacked my Greekness uh, by doubting the fact that uh, not believing I can, I, I can still uh, be Greek. Uh, and, and the other officer who was very sympathetic says, so what will you do if something happened with the opposite ones? And in Lesbos, Turkey is on the opposite side. Metus and, and my response, which was disbelieving, and I think it shocked me, was, I have property on this island, do you? <laughs> right. so, so you see how these things connect in terms of, uh, if you're not Orthodox, can you fight? Uh, so right. yeah, Orthodox yeah. in Byzantium and all that. I... I, I... So I have a, well, not, it's not similar, but it's comparable um, and far less serious. I remember um, the first days in basic training and uh, we were being marched around because that's, that's pretty much all you do for two months. You just march around. And at some point they were giving us one of these, I don't know, orientations into the Arabs and in, in the infantry. And um I think the captain knew that I had degrees in history and he, he singled me out at some point. He said, you know, you, um, who is the patron saint of the army since you're a Byzantinist? I think he said that. And I, the, I had no idea what he was talking about, but I, I knew my military saints <laughs> and I said, St. <"Saint> Mercurius. <laughs> Yeah, which is a, a bit esoteric. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. Wasn't he the one who killed Julian or something in one of those visions? I, I don't know. But 
Yeah. Um, and he, he looked at me like, no, he said, what an idiot. No, it's St. George. And I'm like, oh, damn it. Of course, of course it's St. George. Right? Anyway, that was my, okay. But okay, for the, for the listeners, just keep in mind that these, all of these encounters take place under conditions of sleeplessness. Like maybe you slept two hours in the past exactly. four days and marching around in the sun for hours. And okay, so yeah, that's just for a bit of background. Um, so we mentioned some of the um, kind of uh, orthodox ideologies that uh, that sometimes lead to, you know, either riots or, or political movements. But should we say something about the movement of neo-orthodoxy in Greece? This is, I, I, th I find it a very peculiar and interesting phenomenon. Can we, before we enter that, uh, I think it would be a good segue because uh, there is a certain aesthetic aspect to neo-orthodoxy. And, uh, and, and I think it would link up. Um, and to be a bit more positive and less whiny about uh, the whole thing, because I think that the pre previous army segment is a bit of, uh, you know, post-traumatic kind of uh, stress uh, uh, venting. Um, think about how it appears in, in, in poetry. I'm thinking of uh, Gatsos uh, writing uh, uh, poetry where you have uh, uh, Byzantine uh, uh, storylines. Uh, στα κακοτράγαλα τα βουνά με το σουράβλι και το ζουρνά πάνω στην πέτρα την αγιασμένη χορεύουν τρεις ανδριωμένοι ο Νικηφόρος και ο Διγενής και ο γιος της Άννας της Κομνηνής I mean it rhymes very well and suddenly you have a Nicephorus a Διγενής and the son of Anna Komnena all together uh, in a, a, some sort of a, a mountainous area uh, alluding in a way to uh, the guerrilla warfare of the Greek War of Independence. And then all these people are further located as the poem moves on uh, to uh, the Morea. Because when you look at the world that Gatsos sets out for them, it is not the large Byzantine Empire, but it is actually very much modern Greece. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of song, uh, it was put to music by Hadzidakis, uh, the other great uh, post-war uh, Greek uh, composer. Uh, the kind of song that everyone, left, right, would have been singing in uh, little bars, tavernas, boats. Um, again, absorbing and inhaling, and you have to wonder how much were they thinking uh, about it, and uh, how did they think of this anakomnimi as part of their modern Greek uh, uh, identity. But that kind of storyline gets us to New Orthodoxy ultimately, because in the, its most intellectual expressions, and I'm thinking of someone like Christos Yanaras, uh, these kinds of aesthetics of an elegant, uh, poetic Byzantium that brings folk traditions and modern intellectualism together uh, do, do really weave uh, together with one another to produce this kind of neo-orthodox uh, narrative at the more intellectual level. I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, no, absolutely. Um, we'll need to tell our, um, our listeners a bit more about what New Orthodoxy is. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I have the, so just, just confession on my end, I'm, I have a terrible gap when it comes to poetry <laughs> and songs, uh, possibly in part because I was raised by an American mother. Um, I just never absorbed all of this stuff. Uh, but so as an outsider, if I can say that, I have the sense that those kinds of elements are rapidly disappearing from modern Greek life. I, I think that the younger generations either don't know these poems and certainly wouldn't know who the people in them are. Or am I wrong? I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to say you're wrong. Uh, because what do I know? I've been living in Vancouver for 13 years, going to Greece for a month sure. every summer. Um, but my sense is that when you actually go to a concert uh, and where people start singing, uh, these are still songs that uh, are somehow known. Oh, fair, um, enough. fair enough. Uh, and that uh, maybe the young eventually will connect with uh, the older generation, like my mother, who would uh, uh, who would uh, who would know them, of course, by heart. 
Uh, is there some sort of uh, gradual uh, fading? I'm pretty sure because there's been more musical production and cultural production in Greece after that. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's completely, uh, completely gone. Yeah, I, I associate it like just with Romeocini in general. Yeah, like it, it, it's something that in the start of the 19th century is a real identity. Yeah. Um, it's something that in increasingly becomes an object of anthropological study. And in the 20th century, it's intellectualized. Yeah. And I think by this point, it's so, you know, rarefied. I, I, I don't think it exists right now. If you were to call someone Romeos, it would just sound like you're being weirdly, like you're a weirdo using this. Like, what are you from the 19th century? Um, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's entirely possible. Uh, the question then is, even if you know the poem, do you think that Anna Komnini is a is a folk singer who plays at the you know bar down the street, or <laughs> you know who who that is? Um, okay, so the, I wanted to mention neo orthodoxy because it's actually a on on the intellectual side. So not the so you mentioned its aesthetic dimensions, and it there is a kind of uh, a school of of painting, especially religious art, that is associated mm -hmm. with it, but on the more intellectual side, it's, it is a, well, I, I mean, I, I've, I've tried to identify its core by reading, you know, a variety of books. And I get the sense that it is basically a rejection of modern Greek identity, and especially of a Greek nation state that is part of the West, whether the European Union or NATO or whatever and an attempt to revive a non-national or transnational orthodox identity of the kind that once existed in the later Ottoman Empire. And that the spokesmen for this movement really critique any attempts by or the orthodox, be it late Byzantium, and they write explicitly about the, the union movement in late Byzantium and, yep. and against it, right? So they condemn any attempt by Orthodox to create closer ties with the West and explicitly sometimes will um, advocate a return to a, not, not so much Neo-Byzantine because I think they know that that sounds impossible, but Neo-Ottoman or even kind of a Russian supremacist. So anything that gets the church away from associating with a nation state and returns it to the late Ottoman model that they prefer so that Orthodox people can focus on religious, their religious identity rather than any of these other secular ones. And um, I, I, I find that they, like even Ganaras will like support neo-Ottoman solutions to the problem of moral decline that he's obsessed with. Yeah, uh, and I mean, I want to just add one more thing. I mean, David, please. I find it, and 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 this school is extremely influential in Greece, and and you know has many publishing outlets, and is, um, you know, venerated as you know deep and serious and all that. And I find it striking that at the heart of it is a rejection of the whole modern Greek national model which had it come from say people on the left like communist and it did it would have been condemned as hostile to the nation and to tre treasonous right so i i find that a strange paradox i mean uh Yanara specifically is uh is quite an interesting uh phenomenon because uh you're completely right that uh in his articulation of uh, of a vision it is certainly not a vision of a of a of a state bounded by these um, uh, uh, frontiers of the modern world that don't fit his vision of where Greek communities, and he really speaks of Greek communities. Uh, and by that he means villages and towns uh, would, would exist. Um, and, uh, and Jan Aras certainly has a very clear critique of, uh, of uh, Western construction of uh, the nation, and on what this construction has done for the Greek psyche, uh, and he's consistent. I've been reading his uh, his his books and his collection of articles in newspapers um, 
going back 20, 30 years, it's the same things coming up uh, again and again and again. Um, what is fascinating with someone like Jan Aras is that even as he does that, he expresses anxieties about decline and about loss of territory. Like Asia Minor is a catastrophic moment where territory right. is lost, national territory is lost, about demographic decline, about um, Ottoman, uh, about Turkish dangers that are actually very geopolitical and very concrete. So there's a two way game that is being played here that, on the one hand, emphasizes this nebulous ecumenicity of a Hellenism that can exist uh, in the form of small individual communities focused on the beautiful aesthetics of a uh, very cleaned up folk right yes there's yes. no there's no poor people in the village they all wear national beautiful right. traditional uh, dresses and all that and sing around uh, in all our great folk uh, songs but at the same time there is this anxiety about where hellenism is that is very state inflected even if that state is constantly being attacked yeah yeah he doesn't fully escape from the model of the nation state and and I, I mean, I have to say that I, even though I disagree with most of this model, I I find it um, intellectually, um, it, well, I'm not say gratifying, but it's good to have alternatives to the model of the nation state being debated. And I also like the fact that he emphasizes he has a he has a kind of moral vision and is willing to structure other arrangements, political, social, and so on, to attain that vision, rather than um, like the, what he considers the degenerate, corrupt, neoliberal model, which is to start with the institutional arrangements that are sort of profit-oriented, and then you know, create a moral mess that you then have to start creating a patchwork to solve the problems that you're creating. Um, now, I don't, I don't sympathize with his moral vision, <laughs> which is the problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I, if, I, if I were to salvage something from, uh, again, a body of ideas with which I have a problem is that ultimately Jan Aras uh, starts in everything he talks about from, from culture and pedia, education. Um, he writes again and again and again about education. Uh, he writes about language and his views on language might be on the conservative side, but at least his understanding is that the way to construct a, a political community of any sort will have to come from uh, these kind of basic cultural sort of ingredients and not from other considerations that we would be considering today. So in the period when the universities are being pummeled left, left right and center from uh, with budgetary cuts, and we're just now in that, uh, in an accelerated version of that, uh, Jan Aras, uh, ironically, would be our ally uh, because he is emphasizing, maybe from a different perspective, very uh, concrete uh, issues that have to do with uh, intellectual formation. Uh, and a citizenship that needs to be aware to exist in any kind of meaningful fashion as citizens. Sure. I find it interesting that these debates in Greece on, on, on both sides, that is the pro-Western liberal sort of national model and the neo-Orthodox model, they quickly become, they focus on late Byzantium um, as its, as a sort of paradigm case. And it's interesting that they look at rival, they, they, they showcase rival individuals and their politics in late Byzantium in order to make the argument. And specifically the neo-Orthodox um, uh, school focuses on like Palamas and the Hesychasts and the, you know, the anti-unionists that is anti-union with the Catholic church, right? And the Westernizers very specifically identify with Byzantines who opted for union like uh, Kizonis and Cardinal Bessarion and so forth. That is, people who, on the basis of their Greek education, which very, very educated people, managed to form uh, friendships, to acquire citizenship, to become prominent in the West as a sign of, you know, these are Greeks succeeding in the West, right? That we can do it. Um, and 
And so late Byzantium is carved up and each side claims its spokesman in it. And um, I just find it interesting how Byzantium gets uh, sucked up into these very, very modern debates. But anyway, so, yeah. So does this then mean that uh, uh, Constantine Paleologos uh, is useful to the revolutionaries uh, in the 19th century uh, and to the people building a nation because of a Uniat stance, uh, uh, because of uh, looking to the West and uh, even if he was not helped and saved by the West, at least he was open to it. Well, you, you know, I think that Constantine the Eleventh has escaped that fate. Um, he he was more or less pro-union. Uh, if you were alive during his reign, you would find that uh, quite a few of his subjects held him to be both illegitimate and even possibly heretical because he was consorting with papal types. Uh, uh, Hagia Sophia was being shunned by the um, anti-union sort of hardcore orthodox types for about uh, half a year before the fall of Constantinople to the Turks because they held that he had polluted it by holding um, a, a union mass in it. And yet, I think that that shadow was lifted from him uh, because of the manner of his death and because he became a symbol for the, for the fall of not only the empire, but of you know independent Orthodox rule in the in the in the Balkans and wherever, and I, I think that that overshadowed his uh, what would otherwise be questionable religious position. Something that, for example, didn't happen with Michael the Eighth uh, Palaiologos, his ancestor, who was far more successful <laughs> at preserving the independence of his empire, but also at the cost of. Uh, you know, bowing to the papacy, and he was hated for that by his subjects, and remembered as a very ambiguous, if not dark, and sinister figure because of that. But I think that that Constantine escaped that fate because of his death. So, I mean, you pointed out earlier that um, the battleground is ultimately Lake Byzantium. Uh, in many ways, that's what we're talking about. So. Um, is there a place for someone like Pselos in the modern Greek uh, narrative? Um, I mean, I know that he appeared uh, in Porphyra Kema, this uh, Greek TV uh, series, um, late 70s, early 80s. I've been trying to locate and find a copy of it. It's an adventure I've never have managed that, um, which was based on a novel by uh, Kiriazis uh, in um, uh, the early 70s which is basically about uh, uh, Romanos, uh, Romanos Diogenes' uh, uh, sort of reign and, uh, and demise and um, his defeat by the Turks and betrayals and so on and so forth. But, um, but so Pselos or such figures completely uh, evade uh, uh, the Greek uh, radar. If Basil II is there, yes, because Bulgar Octonos is very convenient. The Bulgar slayer is very convenient for the modern Greek nationalist narrative, but not much more. Well, I mean, it's interesting that you should mention those figures. So I don't think that Pselos is useful for any current ideological program. He just doesn't right, fall into, I mean, unless you just, <laughs> unless you just want to sympathize with, you know, sharp witted, troublemaking, selfish narcissists, <laughs> unless, okay. Um, but he doesn't, he's not that useful, unlike the later the Hesychasts or the pro union types. Whereas Basil II, the Bulgar slayer, was useful in one context only. And, and those were the Balkan Wars, right? In the early 20th century. And the, okay, there's a complicated set of conflicts. We're not going to get into all of the background here, but. Um, he was recruited as a figure, right, in the prosecution of those wars, uh, with, in which 
uh, Bulgaria emerged as a eventually as a as a rival to Greece, especially for who who gets to keep Thessaloniki and you know Macedonia and and so forth. And uh, did did you want to say something about uh, Penelope Delta? Uh, that's uh, that, that's where I was going to go because I mean uh, through Penelope Delta and and her work and her novel, uh, he uh, he enters. Uh, a young person's consciousness uh, in uh, in Greece. Uh, before I was given any uh, Byzantine content uh, with a school curriculum, uh, and I think the first real concrete uh, reference to Byzantium in the school curriculum was in the fifth class primary school back in our days. Uh, I had encountered uh, Byzantium through uh, Pinelope Delta, who of course plays in some ways double duty with her work uh, because she's very convenient for the Balkan Wars, but in a Cold War era where there is a clear association in the minds of the right-wing state uh, of Bulgaria and communism, right, my mother, right, right. my mother at school as a communist, was being pointed at by her teachers as the Bulgarian one. Oh, yes. uh, okay, yeah, no, so no, no, Pinelope, no, right. Pinelope Delta really is a very useful Byzantine tool for Cold War politics too. Right, right. So just a, some background. Pinelope Delta wrote, among many other books, um, a book on the uh, the, the time of ba Basil the Bulgar Slayer, and it's it's a historical novel about Basil II, but it's really coded, you know, kind of war against the the, the Bulgar Bulgarians, and this was early twentieth century, uh, in the context of the Balkan Wars, and uh, by the way, uh, her her father. Uh, was uh, Benakis, who was one of the major donors to for the founding of our school, yep. Athens College, right? That's why the main building is called Benakio. And uh, and her great grandson was Samaras, the the prime minister of Greece uh, five five eight to five years ago, who used the Macedonian issue. As yes, a wedge he did. Issue in, in the early '90s, and toppled the conservative government. He did, uh, basically picking up uh, uh, the mantle of his relative, and uh, and running with it. Yes, and was also a graduate of our high school. <laughs> you keep you keep reminding me. <laughs> no, I mean it's the it's the, this is an episode about Athens College. I didn't tell you. Um, uh, anyway, no, I mean it it uh, it all circles around and ties together nicely. Um, so, okay, let's talk about politics, finally. Byzantium in modern Greece, left or right? Well, tricky, uh, because you would assume it's right. Well, okay, uh, so let's start with the obvious. It's totally right. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So, I, I've come across this very often. When I tell people in Greece I'm a Byzantinist, they automatically assume not take it for granted but assume as a working hypothesis that i am strongly affiliated with the church and that i am right-wing if not fascist and proceed accordingly so i have to then explain no 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 <laughs> okay so there is at least that assumption yes okay i think uh, i think that is a given uh but um uh, where I where I wanted to raise an objection is not on on, on that is on uh, on how it is used by politicians on the ground. Um, right. I mean, think about it. Uh, in the eighties and nineties, one of the most powerful parliamentarians and minister uh, from uh, PASOK, the Socialist Party, that used to be do politically dominant at the time, was uh, Stelios Papathemelis uh, from Thessaloniki, uh, and uh, Papathemelis was. Uh, hand in glove with the church and had visions of uh, the nation that were very much um, uh, Byzantine inflected uh, and certainly orthodox uh, Batrest. So it is conceivable that you can be uh, in a party that is not a party of the right, Pasok was not a party of the right, it was a socialist party, and still use uh, uh, Byzantium uh, as part of a, a, a nationalist narrative. And it is not so strange because PASOK, for all that it was a socialist party, was a party that harnessed a form of nationalism, not a right-wing nationalism, but a independent from the Americans and from the foreign powers that want to dominate us kind of narrative. 
So in that sense, I wanted to just register a, a slight uh, tweak of the, of, the, of the discussion here. Oh, sure. I mean, there are lots of ways to tweak it. For example, yeah. there have been a number of uh, modern Greek intellectuals on the left um, who were, if, if not Byzantinists, you know, who worked a lot on Byzantinists, on, on Byzantium, like Zvoronos and so forth, and who would use Byzantium specifically to undermine the right-wing national narrative of Greek history, especially the history of continuity. And so the idea here is that, um, no, no, Byzantium is this multi-ethnic empire. Um, it has nothing to do with this, you know, um, small Greek national narrative that you're all constructing. It doesn't, you know, anyway, because, you know, in the late 19th and good part of the 20th century, you know, Greek national continuity had very strong racial uh, component. I mean, I, I don't think there's any reason to deny that. Um, and that from the uh, critique from the left, uh, Byzantium is very useful in that regard. So that, that also happened. Um, but it, it's interesting that, so in the past decade, Greece has g gone through a, um, you know, marginal flirt flirtation with fascism, with the Golden Dawn Party. And I found it interesting that it never really fully, well, okay, so th these were basically, um, you know, uh, you know, little petty criminals and thugs and so on. I, I, I don't think that we would have gotten any kind of developed ideology from them other than some very crude, you know, racial purity stuff that they knocked off from whatever Nazi, you know, models they were using. But on the religious question in particular, I, I don't think, I mean, it was hard to tell whether they were neo-pagan Scandinavian Nazi types or hardcore Orthodox fundamental, like they were playing both sides. It, it's tricky because uh, Golden Dawn in its uh, early days when it was just a bunch of right-wing lunatics on the fringe where nobody knew them uh, and were kind of irrelevant unless you were unlucky enough to meet them at the, in the dark. Uh, uh, back then, they, ideologically, they were basically Rosenbergian Nazi. Uh, religion did not have a, a place uh, in their view of the world. Um, in, in fact, orthodoxy could almost be seen uh, as uh, the Jewish conspiracy to dilute right. the Greek spirit. Uh, when uh, the crisis happened and this grand opportunity for opening up was offered, they had to adopt orthodoxy. Uh, right. so, so there is a certain conflict in the, in the, in the rhetoric of, uh, of, of Golden Dawn as they try to open up to a Greek society that uh, exists in an orthodox uh, placenta. Exactly. This is why I was so baffled by, like, are they neo-pagans or are they neo-orthodox? Like, I couldn't tell. And this is the interesting thing about the neo-pagan movement, and you're, you're, you're exactly right to mention this, that neo-pagans in Greece, insofar as they're, they have a political ideology, it's generally on the right, like if you're insisting on racial continuity, then you're, you're on the right. And that makes them very hostile to Byzantium because they see Byzantium as this evil force that destroyed ancient Hellenism, right? And if you look at the comments of a lot of websites all over the place, they, like, they, they can't get over this. They think of Byzantium as this evil force that, dis that murdered and assassinated ancient Greek culture and its religion because they, they believe in that religion. And so for them, orthodoxy is evil. And so it's, it's impossible for them to, to develop a, a sort of fascist Byzantium because they're its enemies, yeah. right? And on the racial side as well, um, so by the way, I was, reading, um, I was reading a book on Nazi law. It's called The Law of Blood. It's an excellent book. And to my surprise, <laughs> Byzantium came up more often than I expected. Yes, in, in Nazi theorists. And so the theory goes that the ancient Romans are these Nordic types. <laughs> okay, bear, bear with me. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so as you might recall, <laughs> the ancient Romans are the Scandinavian Nordic types. And 
their mistake was in extending citizenship to all of these racial, racially inferior people and in intermixing with them. And for Nazi um, legal theorists, the term Byzantium referred to the end process um, of that policy, which was all people in the empire have citizenship and therefore Syrians and Egyptians and Greeks and Anatolians and Balkan types, they're all just thrown in and intermingled, creating this racial mixed monstrosity. And that's what they called Byzantium. And their attempts to refashion German law were designed to prevent that from happening in Germany. So, okay, so Byzantium is what you get when you don't build the wall. Uh, the wall among the races. Yes. Yes. And so when you read Byzantine history and, oh, here's someone with this Arme Arme Armenian descent and here's someone with this Arab name and here's, right? And they see that as, as racial degeneration. And so if you're, if you're like that far on the right that you're inclined to those kinds of views of history, you're again not going to like Byzantium. So um, these are these are these are strikes against Byzantium in the in the right wing imaginary. The funny thing, of course, is that uh, not on the racial side, but on the you know the Hellenic spirit and its corruption uh, side of things. Uh, if you were to read, uh, uh, and this is a person I like, uh, Nikos Dimou, uh, as a Europeanizing voice uh, uh, in Greece uh, with an orientation that is. Uh, uh, towards the West, uh, his view of Byzantium in that sense is not dissimilar. Not, again, not on the racial side, but on the cultural side, because for him, and his uh, sources are, of course, and footnotes are all uh, no more modern than Voltaire, uh, it is these uh, Byzantine uh, theocrats who have destroyed the rationality that was and to which we need to reconnect if we ever want to rejoin Europe in some fashion. So... Uh, Byzantium is a, is a foe in that sense to the European-minded uh, sort of uh, intellectuals uh, in Greece who approach it uh, by way of Voltaire and the Enlightenment. Exactly. And, and this goes back to the foundation of modern Greece, to Korais and others who were echoing this Enlightenment disdain for Byzantium on the grounds of its being superstitious and non-democratic and all of this. You know, the, the usual prejudices that we're all familiar with, they're definitely, as it were, enlightened Greeks who have perpetuated that, that image and who sometimes find the Byzantine legacy kind of embarrassing. Uh, it, even in some of its folk versions, like k kissing icons and the worship of relics and these sorts of things, which totally happen in the West as well. Exactly. <laughs> But um, yeah, no. You're, 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 These are the people for whom Psellos would be useful. Yes, yes, yeah. Those, <laughs> yeah. He's the yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess our conclusion here is that that modern Greece is a very complicated place uh, with a, a lot of intellectual currents um, swirling a, a, about each other, and where the way you sometimes expect things to fall out, they don't. And you get some really weird permutations in its intellectual scene. I, I think uh, I would agree with that um, summation of, uh, of, the, of the discussion, even if uh, I think it's less exciting than the discussion itself. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I found this a very, uh, very interesting discussion and uh, I hope our listeners do too. And I think we're almost out of time. Any closing comments? Uh, no, no, not really. I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to wait for, uh, my next opportunity to visit Hagia Sophia, the way that, uh, things are going. It's probably going to be the stadium of Ayak in Athens. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, right. Let's see. If we can't have that one, we'll build our own and we'll make it a soccer field just, uh, just uh, for good measure. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, it's a, uh, I guess Sophia was a political uh, space like the Hippodrome. I guess we're now blending them together. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, actual battles took place in there, political events, acclamations, all kinds of things. It's uh, it not just a church. But uh, 
Anyway, good. Uh, Dimitri, it's been a pleasure and I look forward to the next time we do this. Excellent. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Talk to you soon.